What's up, Hobby Maniacs? Rob Bear here today with a little bit of a flashback for you. This is Codex Eye of Terra. Terror. <laughs> it came out uh, roughly 13, 14 years ago, back in the early 2000s, and this was the debut of the Wolfen models, which is really exciting because there was Wolfen, uh, you know, 13th company for our Space Wolves. They had some Eldar in here, and then they also had an interesting army called the Lost and the Damned for Chaos, which kind of made a big splash on the tournament scene back in those days, whereas nothing else in the book, this book was really like super competitive, but it was really fluffy, and it was like a global campaign right on the heels of the Armageddon campaign, the Armageddon supplement that came out in early third edition. And it was a really exciting time for the hobby. People were like, you know, making all these new armies, you know, all this stuff going on. And it really seemed like, you know, the 40K hobby was going in a great direction forward. And then this was like the last one. <laughs> and it stopped. And then like, you know, 13 years later, we start getting all these other supplements. So it started picking right back up. And of course, now we're seeing the Wolfen coming out with, you know, the whole Curse of the Wolfen series that's happening right about now-ish, <laughs> depending on when this video drops. So, uh, really exciting times. I want to get to this. I want to do some reminiscing. I want to show you guys, uh, for, for some of the new hobbyists out there that never, never even heard of this or never even seen this, an opportunity to kind of, um, I guess, live, live the past and kind of check out what happened, what was going on back in the day. But before we get to all that, I would like to invite you to stay in the trenches. Make sure you click on the Patreon link up at the top to help keep our videos free in 2016 here on YouTube. Subscribe to this YouTube YouTube channel of course as well check out the blog spikybitsblog.com we're coming up on 9,000 articles over the past nine years over there and yes I will say it when it happens it will be over 9,000 <laughs> and make sure you head on over to the longwar.net that's the home of the battle reports for exclusive content early access videos where you get a lot of these videos two weeks early over there and promotion codes to save money on the things you buy every day for the hobby well at least every month I imagine uh, you know become a veteran of the long war today over there so like I was saying, this is a really cool book. Uh, it was cool back in the day, and now it's kind of seen a little bit of resurgence with the wolf and stuff. And, you know, there's some Eldar stuff in here. And you got the whole, like, I guess, um, uh, Imperial Armor 13 for Apocalypse that kind of follows along with the, in the Lost and the Damned uh, kind of feel. But it's not quite the same, but it's, you know, it's not quite uh, as different as we would expect as well. And, you know, I was actually looking at my bookshelf, and I was like, yo, where did this book come from? Because I didn't think I still had mine, right? And I opened it up, and the weirdest thing happened. I don't know how I got this book. But look who's uh, look whose name's on the inside of this book. Huh. <laughs> I know me and him did some horse tra uh, some horse trading for some uh, some older books. And uh, I guess I just got this uh, to sweeten in a deal. So that's uh, really interesting that I, uh, air quote, stole Larry's copy. <laughs> Sorry, Larry. If you're seeing this, I'll, I'll send it back to you, buddy. Anywho, so this is a 40-page uh, supplement right and you can kind of see there what what they got going on you got some history um, there's there was basically typhus kind of came about and was doing the, the whole uh, uh, plague zombie thing that's what plague zombie started out then you got the black crusades and it's going on to like the webway what's happening on the webway the 13th crusade for Abaddon and then it gets into like the actual rules themselves and the armies which you got the space will 13th company the Cadian shock troops and that was the first time Creed came out not quite the Creed everybody talks about with his like you know um, master strategy kind of thing but he's still a pretty good creed and then you got the lost and dam that we talked about and the all strike force another interesting thing to talk about is this little guy right here this uh this little uh stained glass uh kind of thing here this was an actual terrain piece that games workshop put out way back in the day this thing was like incredibly overpriced but it's so cool now it's it was like 70 dollars and it was like a resin cast with actual stained glass in it um so it was obviously handmade and very well done it was just kind of like a relic of the the old days and it's really cool to see um you know when you see it here there's actually one at, up at the local gaming store and i don't even think they know how much it cost like back in the day because it's just kind of sitting on the shelf so there's an overview of what's going on you know aldrad's like yo chaos is getting real we got to go stop them all right boys let's go do it and remember this is the book that eldrad theoretically died in um, I guess he came back because he's in the current Craft Worlds Codex, but it is what it is. And then it gets into, you know, the Vogans and um, the Vostrians and the kind of like uh, betrayals and things, the spreading of the plague. And then it gets into like the war and the web, the webway and things like that. Um, the, the crusade coming out from the eye. And then it gets into, you know, the rundown of battle, the order of battle here and all the chapters involved, all the Imperial fleets and things like that. And then, of course, Abaddon himself. And then it gets into... 
remember this was an expansion and it gives you this like force work thing right here to basically break down how to make your armies and then it gets into the army section well excuse me it gets into the um, I guess I want to say the showcase the heavy metal showcase right here and it shows you these here they are here's the old Wolfen models and these were on 25 mil bases pewter models they depending on where you, you look for them they go for about 70 to 90 dollars on eBay whether they're going to keep their value with the new plastic kit coming out remains to be seen. And then you've got the great 13th Company models. And there was a 13th Company box set that came out back in the day. And what it did was it included some of the parts from the, I think it was the Blood Claws at the time. I don't think they had a Grey Hunter squad. I think it was a Blood Claws squad. And what it did was it gave you some Chaos backpacks. It was like a Chaos accessory sprue that came in it as well. And that's why you see some of these guys because remember they were outfitting their, their gear and stuff in the warp. They were, you know, as they killed Chaos Space Marines, they're like, well, yo, I need a backpack. Let me grab his backpack. And then so they kind of got this hodgepodge kind of look to them because they were basically chilling in the war. And they came out around Cadia to help, you know, fight in the, against the 13th Crusade. But it's not, I guess, with the Wolfen and, and the things that are happening right now, they're basically popping out all over the place, all over the galaxy. Um, and they figure out how to do that. So it's a little bit different fluff, but kind of still the same. And then here you can kind of see a whole amassed army of the 13th Company. And then the Wolfen weren't their own army. They were just kind of part of it. And, you know, it, it remains to be seen kind of how that's going to happen in the new supplement. But anyways, it's pretty neat stuff. And then they use the Vampire Counts Dire Wolves for Fenrisian Wolves. And if you look, they're on the little old square cavalry bases from way back in the day. That's what we used to put our bikes on that you can see right there. And then on the next page, they kind of show uh, Logan Grimnar had already been out, but they showed a def uh, Defiler model, which actually came out, I think, that summer of like 2013. 2003 I want to say it came out that summer and then the Abaddon that's been in here a bunch of different places and then some great graphics of the Ayatera and it gets into another section on the Ultway Strike Force uh, I think we skipped over the Cadians yep so then you get the Ultway Strike Force and this was the very first time they came out with a Seer Council box actually and some of these guys you couldn't buy separately some of these Farseers I'm not sure if they're still available now or if they will ever be available again but this was you know a box set it was like 40 50 bucks and that was the only way to get them and then in this this picture here they show you the um the, what is it the strike the strike guardian the storm squads and they had an extra um, metal bits that came in a normal guardian kit to make them that now they popped out of webway portals and they would disappear into webway portals that weren't too competitive but they were definitely fluffy and a lot of people played this list and here you can see a converted uh farseer on jet bike this is not standard this was taking one of these guys here um, you know, cropping them off at the waist and putting them on and doing some sculpting onto a jet bike. In the background here, you can also see some of the older, older models. Like you got the metal Warwalker, the metal, um, what is that, the heavy weapon battery, excuse me, the support weapon battery. And then you have an armor cast Phantom Titan actually wrecked in this in the background here. You don't really see stuff like that anymore because Forge World kind of took it over. And then if you're into spending a million dollars on your army, not really a million, but you kind of get what I'm saying there. Uh, well, back in the day, if you think stuff was expensive now, well, getting a whole army of Cadians was actually really, really ridiculously expensive. Uh, even for the day, because, I mean, each one of these guys, I think, was like $8. They were all metal. Like, and so, you know, you start adding up all the costs of this. Even now, a plastic Cadian is roughly, you get 20 in a box for like, what, 40 bucks? So that's like roughly $2 a model. But, you know, these guys were eight bucks a model. So theoretically, this army is more expensive than a Cadian army you could make today. And not only count, not only saying that, but these uh, upgrades on these chimeras and stuff, these are all metal. These were like metal ablative armor uh, plating that you could buy extra. And those sets were like 15, 20 bucks back in the day. So you, when you take a look at this, it's hard to, you're like, wow, this old, those models are old and you know, it's hard to get the, the proper respect for them. But man, these things were pewter. They would come two to a blister for 15, 16 bucks. Sometimes you could buy the, the heavy weapon separate, but, and they were, you know, they were for their day. This was the shit right here. And it was really exciting to see armies like this on the tabletop. Yeah, obviously you didn't see too many uh, Cadian armies, but it's still neat to see displayed out like that. And then for the, <clears throat> for the lost and the damned, that was a really interesting kind of whole thing as well because they had another kit that came out. It was called like the Mutants uh, Upgrade Kit and it came with all these sprues. It was pretty fresh. It was like 25 bucks. You got like five sprues and it was like an Orc Sprue, a Chaos Mutation Sprue, which they don't they don't even have anymore. I, I, and of course, they've changed the Orc Boy Sprue since then as well. It was like a Zombie Sprue and I think it was some Beastmen too as well. So it was really interesting. These were all the, like, the things you could make. It was a very customizable army. It was super exciting and it was like very hobby centric 
really cool to see on the tabletop. Unfortunately, this army became, or fortunately, depending on who you ask, <clears throat> became one of the more competitive builds for the time. Like, you know, roughly 2003 to 2007-ish, around in there. It became actually pretty good on the tabletop. And then you could take um, looted, um, not just for orcs, but looted Lehman Rust tanks and things like that. And then when you get into the rules, you're going to see some of the stuff that, that actually today, it kind of, you're like, oh, wait, I know what that is. I heard of that. Oh, that's where that came from. And yeah, stuff like that, like Psychic Powers, The Gate. Um, this wasn't the first time we saw The Gate, but it was definitely the most, one of the most recent. It was probably the only time in the 2000s we saw The Gate Psychic Power. And that's basically where you would pick something up and you would teleport it back onto the tabletop and then it would deep strike in. Really cool stuff there. And then this was basically how they built out the 13th company. They didn't have any transports. They only had elites, troops, um, excuse me, they had their troops with their gray slayers, their fast attacks with a Frenesian wolf pack, which people used the uh, dire wolves from vampire counts, or the storm claw biker packs, that's why you saw them there. Heavy support was actually the long fangs, and they could split their fire, and they were actually pretty good. Um, you could also do a scout move. There was a way to do a scout move where you could move them before the game started. And then you have your normal stuff up here, rune priest, wolf freeze, wolf lord, um, but you're Elites were your Wolfen Pack and your Stormclaws Pack. So that's kind of how you put together an army. But the really cool thing was you could gain them around the board, and that was like their thing. And then when it came to the Canadian Shock Troops, this was the first time that um, that you kind of saw this like variant list. Like there was a, uh, what was it? There was a Codex Imperial Guard, but it wasn't quite the flavor of what, what we have today. What we have today for the Astra Militarum is more based on this Cadian Shock Troop um, army list right here, to be quite honest. And if when you start reading it, you're like, oh, okay, this makes sense. You know, they got Kastrakins, which were a specialized Stormtrooper only for the Cadians, and now, of course, it's a little bit different. These guys could deep strike in. You could um, kind of kid them in the old book to have um, two special weapons. So it was like 75 points, you could deep strike them in, they could have two special weapons, and you could give them a demo charge. And I forget exactly how it worked. I don't think it was the Kashikins, I think it was the Stormtroopers themselves. Depending on the doctrine you took, they could do that. And then they basically poured it over into the Canadian weaponry, the Demolisher charge, Demolition charge, which was used previously Katachan only, if I remember correctly. So a lot of things coming together and kind of forming the direction that a lot of the books have taken to today which is really cool to see. And then it gets into, you know, you got sanctioned psychers, which had specific powers. And then you got into um, the youth army platoon, which was basically turned into kind of like the white shields of today. Um, you got your Kassikin, you got your command platoon, things like that. And then the first appearance of Creed, he didn't have his like, well, he had his master strategist, but it wasn't quite the same. Uh, if there was a mission, if there was a choice of mission based on strategy rating, and what, what happened was back then, every army had a strategy rating, and you got to pick the mission based on your strategy rating. And I think Marines was like three, and things like Orcs and Chaos, which weren't too strategic, were like a one. So it kind of puts you at a disadvantage right off the bat to even be playing those armies. And to be quite honest, you got to set up your army, and then you got to see your opponent, oh, excuse me, you got to set up one unit, then your opponent would set up a unit, then you would set up a unit, and then vice versa on down the line. And to be honest, for a veteran player that was uh, really into tactics and very strategic, you could win the game right off deployment. And I did that quite a bit back in the day, to be quite honest. Like, you would faint and then put the bulk over here or start in the middle, spread out, etc., etc. You can do the same kind of exploits in X-Wing and... Uh, um, excuse me, X-Wing and Star Wars Armada these days as well, but you do have a pilot skill, uh, at least in X-Wing involved, so there is a little bit of an order, but with Armada, you can get a little abusive with it and kind of trick people out um, because there's a lot of variant. Like, you don't have to set up your, your ships uh, this way, you know, going for you can set them up this way because your maneuvers or, you know, can do all sorts of things. So whatever, we're not talking about Star Wars Armada, but I'm just kind of comparing how, you know, turn zero or the pre-turn is, is back in the day was actually a thing and it kind of ports over together, you know, to some other games in the current, um, I guess, tabletop industry or tabletop environment here. Um, could always choose a mission. Similarly, they would choose uh, to win the dice roll to, ch to choose the table edge or request that the dice for the first turn are re-rolled. It's kind of some mechanics that aren't really in play today, and like I said, not exactly the master strategist role that everybody made all those memes about on the internet, but you kind of get where they're going with that, you know? So you, this is kind of built the foundation for a lot of things we see in the game today. Lost in the Damned, like I said, <laughs> these guys were the ones that kind of became a little bit abusive um, because it was kind of an amalgam of rules, and at the time, there was some stuff that was a little bit abusive, and the abuse 
if I remember correctly, came from the ability to take a fast attack demon beast pack. So people would take Furies and then they would mark them and they would have stuff that was like crazy amounts of attacks, crazy fast, you know, jump pack troops that had basically four attacks that were high initiative or high strength and yada yada yada. And, and that just kind of like beat sticking them in the people's faces on the flank. And then up the middle, they were taking the mutants and things, which were like three wound um, monstrosities. You could take whole, whole hordes of plague zombies, and that's where plague zombies first started. And we'll get to that here in a second. So not a lot of stuff still works the same in here, but it kind of gives you an idea. Like, basically, this is laid out similar to... Um, the Imperial Armor 13 book from uh, from Forge World, this is kind of the basis for that book as well. Because you're not really going to see anything like this because it draws from so many dexes. And I feel like that's basically what we have formations for today. And I would imagine that the designers agree because we haven't seen a mechanic like this in quite some time except for um, Imperial Armor themselves. And they tend to police the rules a little bit better. So you can kind of see here, you get, the, you get the HQ, which could be a Greater Demon, could be Aspiring Champion, could be an Arch Heretic, uh, which was counts as a Chaos Lieutenant slash Sorcerer. And then you have the Big Mutants Possessed or Demon Packs here. And Demon Packs also meant you could get, you know, Nurgling, so you could, or excuse me, Plague Bearers, you could get Bloodletters, etc, etc. Troops were just straight, you know, uh, Imperial Guardsmen, Traitors, Mutants, including the Plague Zombies, uh, Gibbering Hordes, such as Nurglings, which are also really fun and tied people down and then fast attack you have the chaos hounds not quite as good as they are today and trader recons which are like sentinels rough riders and hellhounds and then heavy support you had the big guns so you could have a defiler but you could also have a lehman rust or something like that so it was a little bit you know it was a little bit fluffy it was kind of a holdover from a better time from kind of like the third edition chaos space ring codex and then here you can kind of see the big mutants there were three wounds toughness four but you could kid them out to be a little bit different and depending on how you marked them and that's what a lot of people did and then the mutants just the mutant rabble squads you could turn into plague zombies um, which gave them the blessing you gave them bloated which was nurgless which was three points a model but their armor save increased to four up so you got these guys that were a big block of uh, 15 to 30 dudes here and you know you just basically just kind of went up the gut and did a bunch of other stuff and it was a very effective army it did well on the tabletop and then you had chaos spawn and chaos hounds not a lot of people took those as i remember and then you get into the ultimate strike force which uh, you know, I guess this kind of ported into a other few things today here and there, but nothing quite that we've seen, I guess, in the past. Now, they, they do have, you know, some interesting stuff, like they have a Wraith Gate, which was basically like a webway portal uh, that people could jump through and things like that. And we've seen that mechanic um, in the past couple of years and even still currently. Waystones were really interesting because, um, what was the, what did this do? I forget the psychers held oh so they could use them basically Eldrad split his psyche into a bunch of different waystones and if you had one of the waystones in your army you could reroll reserves which was really interesting but the autarchs basically help with that these days and then the first time we saw the psychic power augment which basically doubled uh, their range I don't think that's still a thing in the current craft world codex i may be misspeaking because you know when you get something like that it isn't quite as op as some of what the other people take you tend to forget about the most basic of things and you know i think that's definitely a problem that's plagued the eldar book unfortunately because you know eldar they're, they're base troops the banshees got better the fire dragons got better the striking scorpions got better but everybody takes the damn warp spiders because they're so op right so it's like man they have such good stuff in there everything just got such a boost for like the first time in so many years and everybody just gravitates to the most op stuff but and then forgets about the basics which are still head and shoulders above some armies out there so you know it's a little frustrating and forgive me but you kind of get where i'm coming from there the other codex in and of itself just taking out the abusive units or the op units or the ones that are most favored it's actually still a codex that can stand on its on its uh you know on its two feet against most stuff out there in and of itself but you know 40k has never been balanced it wasn't balanced back then it wasn't balanced in third edition it wasn't balanced in second edition i mean you could win whole games in second edition before the the game even technically started with like virus bombardments you had cyclone missile launchers that could shoot all of their missiles in one volley for space wolves and just obliterate stuff off the table oh no i can't shoot like the following rounds but hey you're dead so who cares <laughs> you know so it's like 40k has never been balanced people all we can do is try to bring back the old good days when the hobby was involved and it seemed to make things better and that's what we're all about here and that's what bringing hobby back is and that's why i'm doing what i do every day here folks so hopefully you enjoy my little 40k flashback walk down memory lane for the ayatara codex book that's 
uh, old and apparently I stole it from Larry Vella. Don't tell him. <laughs> Deleted scenes, bonus content, and all the interviews and post game wrap up videos can be located in the Hall of Veterans on the longward.net. Visit the longward.net today and try a week completely free with no strings attached. That's not all. The longward.net is also your hobby resource for exclusive early access with an ad free experience to all your favorite videos. Members of the Hall of Veterans gain early exclusive access to multiple hobby videos.